I may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment on which a recorded vote is ordered. I now recognize myself <clears throat> for an opening statement. Good morning and thank you for joining us for this full committee markup. Before we get into today's business, I do want to take a moment and recognize and applaud the signing of the Bipartisan Compact of Free Association Amendments Act of 2024 as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Bill. This legislation supports and reaffirms America's strong alliance with the freely associated states in the Indo-Pacific and forcefully pushes back on the Chinese Communist Party's aggression in the region. The COFA Amendments Act was the product of months of bipartisan work in this committee. I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Grijalva and all the members of the Indo-Pacific Task Force, including Chairs Rodawagon and Sublime, for their dedicated leadership. I'd also like to thank Speaker Johnson for, for supporting the inclusion of COFA in the Appropriations Bill. The <coughs> legislation's champions in the Senate, including Senator Manchin and Senator Brasso, as well as President Biden for signing it into law. Last but not least, I also want to thank the staff of the Natural Resources Committee from both sides of the aisle who worked diligently on the passage of the legislation. The longstanding partnership between the United States and the FAS has been renewed, and as a result, our countries and our citizens are more secure. Now switching gears to the business before the committee, I want to discuss a global problem, the striking shortage of critical and hard, hard, hard rock minerals that are needed for our future. This has been a growing concern for years, but we're approaching a tipping point. And recent reports show that global demand for renewable energy, electric vehicles, battery storage, and other technologies will vastly outpace the known supply of resources necessary to build them. The difference between what we have mined, what we have scheduled to be mined, and what, will, what we will need is several orders of magnitude. The Biden administration has set ambitious goals for renewable energy deployment in the U.S., which of course requires major increases in mineral production to make these technologies function. When I sat in the House chamber last Thursday and listened to President Biden tout his clean energy record, I found it particularly notable that he failed to mention anything about the minerals those technologies depend on. Perhaps, of course, that's because he and his administration have actively fought against mineral development here in America. We must all use the tools at our disposal from permitting improvements to domestic mines to increasing recycling technologies and our domestic refining capacity to support this vital economic sector. The longer we do nothing, the worse the problem will become. That's why today we will consider Congressman Lamborn's legislation amending the Fixing America's Surface Transpiration Transportation Act or the FAST 41 Act to codify mineral production as a covered sector under the Act. Under former President Trump, the Permitting Council expanded FAST 41 projects to include mining, ensuring that all hard, hard rock mining projects are eligible for the project streamlining benefits of FAST 41. However, President Biden reversed that decision and implemented a rule narrowing the scope of eligible mining projects to only critical minerals. This creates unnecessary bureaucracy for important domestic mining projects that could otherwise benefit from the permitting streamlining benefits of the FAST 41 process. For example, USGS does not list copper as a critical mineral, yet copper is essential for many aspects of modern life, including construction, electrical and electronic products, transportation and industrial equipment. HR 6862 would ensure all hard rock mineral projects are eligible for streamlining before the FAST 41 process in the future. <clears throat> it's the kind of common sense legislation uh, we're all about here on this committee. The legislation uh, will safely and responsibly provide access to American resources and allow our nation to prosper. I'm proud to live in a country that innovates better than anywhere else in the world. The Biden administration needs to stop its endless war on American natural resources and unleash the power of our energy and minerals. We need to get out of our own way. I look forward to a robust discussion on this legislation and the other bills we're considering today. And I yield back and recognize uh, Ms. Comlogger Dove for any opening statement she may have. I don't have any. Well, that was quick and easy. <laughs> then we will move on to uh, business at hand. 
And pursuant to the markup notice, it is now in order to consider H.R. 6862 to amend the FAST Act to include certain mineral production activities as a covered project for other purposes and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources be discharged from further consideration of the bill. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open to amendment at any point. Does any member wish to be recognized for purpose of debate on the bill? Mr. Lamborn, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, we gather, among other reasons, to mark up my bill to ensure that all mineral mining projects receive consideration under the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act. Title 41 of this act, known as FAST 41, grants numerous departments with NEPA authority the ability to speed up the permitting process for infrastructure projects subject to the NEPA process, which is National Environmental Policy Act. The entire reason that Congress passed this law in the first place was to improve consultation and coordination among government agencies during permitting, to increase transparency by publicizing completion dates, timetables, authorizations, and environmental reviews for all federal agencies with authority over these projects, and most importantly, to get shovels in the ground for critical infrastructure projects more quickly and within a reasonable budget. In 2021, hard rock mineral mining was added as a covered sector under FAST 40, 41. Because it is so crucial to numerous emerging industries and is necessary to maintain our standard of living, safety, and technological superiority. Hard rock mining is vital for items like copper, which is necessary to build out the transmission and distribution projects Americans will soon rely on. We also need it for steel and iron, which build everything from skyscrapers to cars, bridges to airplanes. Lastly, hard rock minerals are the basis for which critical minerals are mined. Critical minerals are produced as a byproduct of another more common host mineral and are necessary for even the Biden administration's stated and ambitious goals surrounding EVs and renewable energy buildouts. It is strange then that in September of 2023, last year, the Biden administration proposed a new rule regarding FAST 41 coverage. The rule titled Revising Scope of the Mining Sector of Projects that are Eligible for Coverage under Title 41 of the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act redefines the covered mining sector so as to only cover critical mineral-based mining projects. The administration insists that this will prioritize critical mineral supply chain projects and will improve timeliness, but we know it for what it is. The Biden administration is overreaching in their quest to pursue a radical climate agenda by arbitrarily choosing winners and losers. The Biden administration relies heavily on the products that come from these mines, which makes their decision to shut down mines, such as the Twin Metals Copper Mine in Minnesota, and now the decision to remove mining from FAST 41 consideration, so puzzling. Aside from the administration's focus on their radical climate agenda, I'm also concerned about continuing to cede leadership in global mining to the Chinese Communist Party. China has a chokehold on the mining and refining industry, so slowing down the permitting process will further cede control of supply chains to our geopolitical rival. Critical minerals are defined by the U.S. Geological Survey and are redefined every three years. Companies beginning the lengthy permitting and siting process may find that the mineral they have targeted has been removed from the USGS within the time frame that it took them to apply for the permit in the first place. This would waste millions of dollars and discourage investment. If we want American mining to flourish, we must compete on a level playing field without the heavy hand of the federal government choosing winners and losers. Needlessly allowing the Chinese government to continue dominating the mining industry will only hurt global stability in the long run. That my bill returns hard rock mining to its original covered status under FAST 41 so that we may continue to expedite all mining projects across the U.S., ensuring domestic reliability and continued growth. Similar language to this bill was included in H.R. 1, the Lower Energy Costs Act, which was passed by the House of Representatives on March 30th, 2023, in a bipartisan vote of 225 to 204. I urge all of my colleagues to support the mineral mining 
uh, Party Act and look forward to passing it through committee today. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion? Ms. Kamlager Dove, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair Westerman. I oppose H.R. 6862. This bill amends the FAST Act to include all mineral production as eligible for FAST 41 coverage. The bill codifies Trump era regulations and withdraws the Biden administration's rulemaking limiting FAST 41 mining eligibility to just crim critical, I almost said criminal, critical minerals. FAST 41 covered projects are entitled to a compressed environmental review and permitting process with less public input and strict judicial review requirements. Under FAST 41, there are also significant restrictions on the public's ability to take unlawful projects to court when they threaten our environment and public health. Covered projects get an, get an abbreviated statute of limitations, only two years compared to the standard six years. And if a project is covered under FAST 41 to be able to sue against illegal project activity, a claimant needs to have submitted a public comment on the issue they are suing over. Often, the harmful effects of unlawfully issued permits, such as for a multi-year mining operations plan, are not known by the affected communities within two years. They are certainly not known far enough in advance for affected communities to leave a public comment before the activity begins. Back in the Trump administration, when mining was added to FAST 41 as a covered sector, then Chair Grijalva raised valid concerns that adding mining creates substantial risks for communities. According to the EPA, mining is the nation's most polluting industry and the potential risks of mining projects go well beyond those of other sectors that qualify for FAST 41. At its inception, FAST 41 applied to transportation projects that pose much fewer risks to the environment and public health compared to mining projects, and it would be inappropriate to extend FAST 41's limited environmental review process to such potentially harmful mining projects. We also know that many of these new mines are on or are within just miles of tribal land, and the lack of tribal consultation requirements in our 150-year-old mining law is just not cutting it. Limiting public disclosure, public input, and judicial review will often mean more pollution is already overburdening these overburdened communities. The Biden administration, and I think the president also did a fine job last Thursday, is currently working on a rulemaking to narrow the scope of which mining projects are eligible for coverage to just critical minerals, which I am still cautious about. But this bill, codifying that all mining projects are eligible, is definitely a bridge too far. Under this bill, for example, a gold company, and gold is not at all a critical mineral, would have to disclose less information to the public while the public would have fewer opportunities to challenge unlawfully issued permits that threaten our health and environment. Also, the largest multinational mining corporations can take and make more money selling luxury goods and avoid being sued if a major issue comes up just two years down the line. To me, that does not seem like a worthy application of the FAST Act. Again, I oppose this legislation and I yield back. Gentlelady lady yields back. Mr. Stauber, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I rise in strong support of H.R. 6862 offered by my good from, friend from Colorado, Representative Lamborn. As we have discussed countless times in this committee, the world needs more minerals and the demand for minerals will only increase in the years to come. H.R. 6862 would ensure that all hard rock mining projects remain eligible for the streamlining benefits of the FAST 41 permitting dashboard. While all hard rock mining projects were eligible to be placed on the FAST 41 dashboard during the previous administration, the Biden administration has reversed this. Thanks to the Biden administration's proposed rulemaking, only critical minerals projects will be allowed to be placed on the FAST 41 dashboard. This proposal puts our mineral supply chains at risk. It jeopardizes our reliability, domestic supply of min minerals like copper, which are important to our 21st century economy, but are not on the USGS critical minerals list. 
These are the very same minerals that are necessary to achieve my Democrat colleagues overzealous renewable energy goals. Thanks to actions like this, we won't be able to source important minerals domestically and we will continue to be reliant on global supply chains that are dominated by foreign adversarial nations like the communist country of China. If you're lucky, the permitting process for mining projects in the United States currently takes roughly 10 years. Some projects, like some in northern Minnesota, have spent over two decades going through the federal permitting process. Meanwhile, the demand for minerals like copper is skyrocketing. Placement on the FAST 41 dashboard allows for streamlined permitting reviews. It still follows the same strict environmental and labor standards we have here in the United States, but simply cuts red tape, allowing these projects to get online quicker. We can mine here, we can process here, and we can manufacture right here in America. We just need the political will to do so. And I urge my colleagues to find that political will and join me in supporting H.R. 6862. And Mr. Chair, with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion on the bill? Mr. Lamborn, you're recognized. Or Mamalfa, excuse me, you're recognized. Yeah, I'm the other one, uh, alphabetically close. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you. You know, I, 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 I sit in this committee and I hear the arguments year after year after year on sensible arguments that our mine products need to come from this country. Well, under the regulations, as they get tighter and tighter, they will not come from this country. They will come from other countries if we're going to have them. My evil twin would say, go ahead, let's shut it all down. Let's not mine a darn thing here. That means we'll at least avoid all these dumb electric car mandates and electric stove mandates and electrify everything else because we won't be able to mine the products or the batteries and the electrification and all that. But that's my evil twin saying that. I, I really believe that um, if, if we're not going to mine it here, then we're just going to make the problem of some other country that doesn't have the safeguards on labor, the safeguards on, uh, um, on how mines are run anyway. And we, we in this country pr place a great premium on the proper uh, disposal, the proper recovery. You know, the bad old days of uh, mining that was done in the past, that's, that's long in the past, the, the decades and even last century. So we need these products here as we're gonna go forward on this and to have a, a, a certain list of some are critical, some are not critical. It depends who's, who you define as critical because anything that's mined um, went to a lot of trouble, a lot of effort even to get a permit. So if you're talking gold, which is used in many industrial applications on, on um, uh, space, space equipment, uh, that uh, you know, satellites, things of that nature, it's a very, very reliable metal that is needed in uh, certain industrial applications. So to say that some metals is less important than the other really forgets uh, the, the end use of so many of them. So we need to mine these products in this country and we need to have a permit process that's fair. And uh, I'd like to yield uh, some time to my alphabetical almost twin, Mr. Lamborn. I thank the gentleman from California, and I will mention that a three megawatt wind turbine contains, and guess, try to guess before I give you the exact amount, how much copper goes into a wind turbine? Three megawatt wind turbine. 6,000 you're, copper. You're getting close, but you're low. 4.7 tons, which is over 9,000 pounds. And an onshore um, and, 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 and certain smaller units still use over 7,000 pounds, depending on the variety of, of wind turbine. So if we're serious about renewable energy, you want to have copper. And yet the, my, my colleague and friend across the aisle is opposing something that would allow for more expedited copper mining. Uh, with a two-year instead of six-year NEPA process, there is still a lot of room for public input and review and transparency. It's just that the timeline is expedited and we don't have big delays, but there are still opportunities for all kinds of review and, and legal challenges. So 
I don't understand the opposition to this bill, and I would uh, urge adoption of the bill. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Reclaiming my time, I'd like to yield time to my colleague from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to add that uh, the, the, in the Duluth complex in northeastern Minnesota is the biggest copper nickel find in the world. In the world. And this administration pulled the leases for one company. In fact, they banned mining over 223,000 acres in the biggest find in the world. Yet, they want us to uh, put these windmills up using copper that's mined uh, by foreign adversarial companies. I will tell you that, that I have sent two letters to Secretary of the Interior, Halland, asking her what the science and facts were when she decided to pull the mineral leases. We've sent two letters and we've got radio silence from this administration. You know why? Because there were no science and there was no facts supporting her decision to ban mining in northeastern Minnesota. And it's, to me, it's simply unacceptable that this administration turns a blind eye the atrocities uh, in, the, in the mining in the Congo who, who use child slave labor, and it's a fact they use child slave labor, yet they turn a blind eye and allow it to be used here in the United States of America. To me, that's simply unacceptable, and I yield back to the gentleman from California. Gentlemen, yields back. I now recognize myself to speak in favor of the bill. And again, I appreciate uh, Mr. Lamborn for introducing this bill, which would ensure that we could mine all of our hard rock minerals. Uh, thinking about, thinking back to making trips with Mr. Stauber to northern Minnesota, uh, I think something that's missed is when you look at all those boring logs that they, they pulled out of the ground up there, in the boring, you see copper, ore, you see platinum, palladium, nickel. There are a lot of minerals all in these, these same deposits. And uh, there's critical minerals, and there's minerals that really should be critical, but that seems to be more of a, a political exercise to deem something critical than a, than a scientific exercise. Uh, I can't imagine how we don't label copper critical when the World Bank says we have to mine more copper in the next 20 years than has been mined in the history of the world. That seems like a pretty critical uh, element to me. And even, even gold, uh, there are a lot of gold contactors in uh, electrical equipment. So uh, I would be hard pressed for somebody to show me a hard rock mineral that is not critical in the age where we're trying to uh, develop more electrical components, more um, windmills, solar panels, uh, all those things that are heavily dependent upon uh, all minerals. And uh, to me, a lot of them are critical. And you know, if you look down the list, uh, we, we've talked about copper, but uh, we're seeing the same problem with uranium. I've got uh, two nuclear power plants in my district in Arkansas. And they produce 40% of the, of the electricity used in the state, and they get their uranium uh, from uh, not from the United States, most of it from Russia or allies with Russia. Uh, I mean, this is a vital fuel, uh, and uranium's classification as a critical mineral was removed in February of 2022 by the Biden administration. How on earth could you say Uranium is not a critical tool, and we shouldn't be mining it here in the U.S., but we've seen legislation in this committee to take the largest deposits of uranium that we have, that we know of in the U.S., and make them off limits for mining. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, in the Energy Act of 2020, which requires the USGS to review and update its list of critical minerals at least every three years, um, Every three years, it seems to be a political football again on what's critical and what's not. We've let too much political science rule the day instead of scientists who know what's critical. Um, H.R. 6862 addresses these issues by codifying mineral production as a covered sector under the FAST 41 permitting dashboard and rescinding the Biden administration's flawed proposed rule. Uh, 
I would like to emphasize that allowing more mining projects to benefit from the FAST 41 program will not come at the cost of American environmental and public safety standards, which happen to be the best in the world. Rather, it will ensure American mining projects move more efficiently through the permitting process. This isn't an end around on the permitting process. It's actually uh, making the permitting process work. I urge my colleagues in supporting this bill and Mr. Lamborn, were you seeking more time? I'll yield you. Thank you for just a quick comment, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your um, very common sense remarks just now. And you made reference to this, and I just want to emphasize what you already have said, and that is that American environmental standards are among the best and most stringent, if not the most stringent and strictest in the entire world. And if you take minerals like copper and see how they're mined in Africa or Asia or other parts of the world, uh, it's just not as clean of a process as it is here. So, and I think we all care about not just the United States, but whether pollution comes from other parts of the world and is generated there or not. And it, with that in mind, we should be happy that this bill is going to allow for some hard rock mining to occur faster that otherwise would not occur at all in this country where we have such clean standards. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I yield back the balance of my time. Is there any further discussion on the bill? Since there's no further discussion, uh, it's now in order to consider amendments to H.R. 6862. I want to recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn, for the purpose of offering his amendment in the nature of a substitute designated Lamborn 064 ANS. Without objection, the amendment is considered read and open to amendment at any point. You recognize. I think we've discussed the bill uh, very well at this point, and I would urge adoption of the amendment. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion on the amendment in nature of a substitute? There is no further discussion on the amendment. It's now in order to consider amendments to the ANS to HR 68. 82, and I recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Comlogger Dove, for the purpose of offering her amendment designated Comlogger Dove number one. Without objection, the amendment is considered read. You recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know uh, my constituents know and environmental justice communities across the country know that we often don't have the full information about the environmental and public health impacts of extractive industrial projects at the permitting stage. It can take years for the full effects of polluted air or water to show up in the form of respiratory disease, skin conditions, heart disease, or cancer. And it can take even longer to trace those public health impacts back to the polluting source. If someone gets sick three years after a mine is permitted in violation of the Clean Water Act, then FAST 41's judicial review provisions would stop that person from being able to ask the courts for relief. And even if they get sick just a year after the mine is wrongly permitted, if they didn't file a comment on that exact issue during the public comment period, then FAST 41 says they're out of luck for NEPA claims. And that just makes no sense to me. Two years is not enough time. Two years isn't enough time to do anything. For mining projects, the stakes are too high when it comes to our environment and public health to limit judicial review and enforcement. My amendment would make sure that any mining projects covered by FAST 41 do not get these judicial review waivers under some of our key environmental protection laws. Anyone harmed should be able to take a mine to court if it was permitted wrongfully under the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, or the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That last statute, RIFRA, prohibits the federal government from substantially burdening a person's exercise of religion, which is especially relevant for the tribal sacred sites that are too often disregarded by mining. For example, the Resolution Copper Proposed Mine, owned by multinational companies Rio Tinto and BHP, was sued over violations of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And important to note, Rio Tinto has an egregious record of human rights abuses, and its largest shareholder is a Chinese state-owned company. There's your baddie right there. 
This Arizona mine proposes to destroy Oak Flat, a site the San Carlos Apache tribe considers as sacred as Mount Sinai. Unfortunately, the Ninth Circuit ruled against Apache Stronghold's religious case to protect Oak Flat. To be clear, we believe this decision is wrong. Tribal communities deserve the same religious freedom protections that are respected for every American. This case will undoubtedly be appealed, and two other cases related to the Clean Water Act and NEPA review have yet to be decided. Under this bill, this controversial mine, owned by foreign companies and proposing to destroy sacred sites and with no clear benefits to the American mining supply chain, would be eligible for expedited permitting review under FAST 41. That is the clearest example of turning a blind eye. We should not be expanding FAST 41 to non-critical minerals like copper, but if my colleagues insist on doing so, then at minimum, these health, environmental, and religious claims still deserve their day in court. This amendment restores vital protections for the public, and I urge support. I yield back. The lady yields back. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Stauber, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I rise in opposition uh, to the amendment offered by my colleague from California, Representative Kamala Gurdup. Uh, this amendment is simply an obstructionist amendment meant to undermine the underlying bill. We've seen time and time again in this country opponents of important infrastructure and resource development projects like mining projects have weaponized our courts to stop projects at every turn. One of the reasons why the FAST 41 dashboard has been such a success over recent years is the judicial review provisions that limit uh, lawsuits that are simply filed to slow down the process. My colleague's amendment effectively repeals these very provisions. Rather than source the minerals necessary for their so-called clean energy mandates from the United States using the strictest environmental and labor standards, Democrats would rather, use, would rather us source these minerals from places where they use child and forced labor like the Democratic Republic of the Congo or where they have terrible environmental conditions like that in Indonesia. And that's all while lining the pockets of the Chinese Communist Party. This amendment will lead to two things, more lawsuits and an even greater dependence on foreign adversarial nations for our future. I urge my colleagues to join me in, in opposing this amendment. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Mr. LaMalfa, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman. I, I, um, I, I, when by the time you run the gauntlet of possible acts here to, uh, in order to go through a process and receive a mining permit and, and start work, and then once that work is underway, you're subject to another round of lawsuits at, at any time. Um, and me being from California, we've done a lot of work on sacred sites areas and, uh, and the respect for those. But also when you're talking the Religious Freedom Act, Restoration Act, that is an undefined, undefinable as to how you, you could be uh, subject to litigation on that, especially since sacred sites aren't always uh, listed or cataloged. We've been through this in California. And, and I can see part of the argument, you don't necessarily want them on a list because you have people that will go around destroying the sacred sites. You know, if um, if there is petroglyphs or other things, but uh, some of them are less defined too. With some of the legislation early on in the state, it, they wanted to define it. If anything is in a view shed of of, of uh, native folks that are there, then that could be part of a regulation. A view shed could go from one mountaintop to another mountaintop in an entire valley. So the uh, ability to sue over this, and I would, if if the author of the amendment doesn't mind, I'd, I'd throw a question towards. Uh, towards you on that is that under what scenario do you see mining permits up being being ironclad enough to not be sued at, at any given time? I, I don't I don't understand how with this much latitude there that a mining permit can be safe, that it can be that a company can decide to come in and invest. I don't care if it's foreign or domestic or what have you. We we need the product, I guess. We you need copper, you need what have you. How, how could they know that, like, okay, we're going to invest, you know, millions of dollars to get to this point, we're going to invest years of time, and then we get there, 
another curveball is going to get uh, thrown at them on that, and, and they have to defend once again, and then they end up losing money. How, how do we get a permit? How, how would they operate? If, if you care to touch on that, to Ms. Kamal, good up. Do you yield? I, I, yes, I do oh, yield. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, ultimately, it's, you know, due process plays a role in all of these systems. I believe that, um, obviously, you know, I have concerns about the mining industry, but at the very least, environmental review, keeping people safe, and stopping unhealthy acceleration should be a pri priority over fast tracking processes and permitting, and then just hoping that people don't get sick or hoping that if they do, it's outside of the um, compressed timeline. I just, we see time and time again, I'm reflecting on projects in my own district that sometimes get temporarily stalled. They have to withstand an environmental review process, and if everything is cleared, they move on. But I certainly don't think, especially when it comes to sacred lands, but also the health and safety of communities within proximity of these areas, that we should be rushing through with a compressed timeline. And I hear the legitimate concerns about competitive advantage going to our adversaries, especially as it relates to mining that happens in other countries. I would also submit that if we were more aggressive in our support with those countries, then they would be able to withstand the pressure coming from our adversaries going into their countries with exploitative relationships designed only to extract materials from their land, leaving us at a disadvantage. Okay. I, I, I'd like to reclaim my time. I, I, we're getting into an area that really is outside of mining permits, but I, I appreciate it, thank you. Um, it, it just boils down to me is that um, we already have, you might say rigorous, or you might say painfully long process to get any mining permit when it's t 10 years or 20 years, as Mr. Stauber was talking about. There, there is no lack of review on that. So let me, let me, Mr. Stauber, I'd like to yield you a little bit of time there. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, you remember a few years back when we had an expert to talk about mining, um, she had said it was too wet in Northern Minnesota and it was too dry in Arizona. And I asked, where would you like to mine? And she said the quiet part out loud, nowhere. And I yield back. Gentlemen, as time's expired, is there further discussion on the amendment? I recognize myself. I oppose the amendment. The amendment would undermine the bill's purpose of ensuring that all hard rock mining projects are eligible for the streamlining benefits of the FAST 41 permitting dashboard. FAST 41 puts a time limit of two years after the publication of the record of decision on claims against projects on the dashboard. That sounds familiar. Seems like this law might be repetitive because we already passed a bipartisan law that puts a two-year time limit on uh, NEPA permits. Um, we passed it less than a year ago and this administration has failed to implement it even one time. Um, and that was passed with broad bipartisan support. We said one year on an environmental assessment and a maximum of two years on an environmental impact statement. And you know, I met this morning with uh, uh, people, military folks from my home state, and they're trying to put in a new uh, area to train pilots to fly the F-35. Uh, guess what's holding them up? And, and it's to uh, take the airspace, not out, but up, up to 60,000 feet. So they're looking at a one and a half to two year delay on being able to train pilots on the F-35 because of the long permitting process. And this, Mr. Lamborn's bill does not sidestep the permitting process. It just says, get your work done in a reasonable amount of time. I yield to the gentleman. Question? What are, are you talking airspace, not not runways or things like I'm that? I'm talking on the vertical airspace above the airspace that's already permitted to train pilots in. We've got a permit 
um, up to 60,000 feet. So between, say, 35 and 60,000 feet, feet needs a new NEPA permit. Right. That's good stuff. I, I, was, I was unaware that that required a permit, but it seems like everything requires a permit anymore, and it's a process that gets drawn out, and it's really hampering our economy, our national security, in many, many ways. You know, when we had the debates, Mr. <coughs> Lamborn talked about H.R. 1. Uh, an example that sticks out to me was the last runway at the Atlanta airport. It took 11 years to build it. Wait, it only took a year and a half to build it. It took nine and a half years to get it permitted. And there's so many examples like that. Um, it's why uh, we need to rescind money from the IIJA and the uh, IRA because there's money that is never going to be spent because the permits can't be or, uh, obtained so that you can spend the money and do the projects. Uh, but this is a, um, a common sense bill that I actually think is a bit repetitive because I think the law already says they can't take more than uh, two years, whether it's um, um, a mining project or, a, or airspace for fighter jets or whether it's a road project or a bridge project. Uh, but Congress has to keep coming back in passing laws, and I think it's time for the courts to do their job for somebody to sue this administration for blatantly breaking the law that was passed on a bipartisan basis by the House and the Senate and signed by President Biden. So I oppose this amendment, I support the underlying bill, and I yield back. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? If there's no further discussion on the amendment, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Comlogger Dove, designated Comlogger Dove number one. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. A recorded vote has been requested. Further proceedings on the amendment designated Comlogger Dove number one will be postponed. We're at the point where we're going to take a break and reconvene at 11.30 uh, for votes. And we will also have lunch in the uh, back office. Uh, I believe that will be here about 11.30. But we will, uh, we're going to uh, take a break, and we'll be back at 11.30. Committee stands in recess.
outside.
And I will remind members again that there are sandwiches and salads in the back room. I uh, encourage you to go by and grab one after we vote. Uh, the unfinished business is on the request for a recorded vote on amendments to the ANS to HR 6862. <clears throat> members will record their votes using the electronic voting system. The question is on the amendment to the ANS to HR 6862 offered by the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Comlogger Dove, designated Comlogger Dove number one, on which the no's prevail by voice vote. <clears throat> the clerk will open the vote. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? Hearing none, the clerk will close the vote and report. Mr. Chairman, on this vote, the yeas are 14 and the nays are 20. And, uh, 
And I want to, uh, the amendment is not adopted, and I want to note that we had an accidental push of the, of the wrong button, so it shows 21 up there to 14, but we're recording the vote as 20 to 14. Mr. Curtis's vote was uh, unintentionally uh, cast, so we're going to ask unanimous consent that we can uh, accept the vote as 20 to 14 with a note on Mr. <laughs> All right. Without objection, the question now occurs on the. <clears throat> the question now occurs on the amendment in the nature of a substitute to HR 6862 offered by the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lamborn, designated Lamborn 64 A and S. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment in the nature of the substitute is adopted. Right. The question now occurs on reporting H.R. 6862 as amended to the House with the recommendation that the bill be favorably approved. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. A recorded vote has been requested. Members will record their vote using the electronic voting system. The clerk will open the vote. Have all members voted? <clears throat> Does any member wish to change their vote? Hearing none, the clerk will close the vote and report. Oh. Mr. Curtis has not been recorded. The, we, we have one more vote. Have all members voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? The clerk will close the vote and report. Mr. Chairman, on this vote, the yeas are 22 and the nays are 13. That's an actual count. The <laughs> bill, as amended, is ordered reported to the House with the recommendation that it be favorably approved. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. I, uh, Mr. Chair, I give notice of my thank you. I give notice of my intention to file supplemental, additional, dissenting, or minority views on the measure just considered. I ask unanimous consent that this notice be extended to all measures considered at this markup under House Rule 11, Clause 2L. This notice extends to all members. Without objection, so ordered. We now turn to the UC package with the cooperation of Ranking Member Grijalva and the other members of the committee. It appears that we have worked out an agreement on 11 bills scheduled for markup today. <clears throat> As we have done before, rather than going through a formal markup process for each of the bills, I will make a single unanimous consent motion to report out the bills favorably with any amendments that have been filed and agreed to. Before we begin, does any member seek time to speak on any of the bills in this unanimous consent motion? Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this um, UC package includes uh, legislation on harmful algae blooms as the uh, representative of the state that has the, the largest hypoxic zone in the United States. Um, very interested in this, in this legislation. I, I do have concerns about a few things in here, including uh, the lack of definition of things like societal and cultural impacts. Um, I think, uh, especially with this administration, it would be in our interest to be thoughtful about exactly what criteria would be used to measure uh, those impacts. And I just, uh, Mr. Chairman, like to ask is, as we move this legislation and work with the Science Committee toward floor action, if we could work together, and I'd like to do this on a, a bipartisan basis to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we're properly putting confines or criteria around those terms. Uh, the gentleman's concerns are noted, and uh, you know, I will uh, gladly work with you and others as we uh, take this issue to the floor. And as you mentioned, this is a bill that came out of the, the Science Committee, so I uh, uh, appreciate you bringing that up. 
Is there, are there any further discussions? Ms. Luna, you're recognized. Um, I would just ask for support for my amendment number 69. It would allow, or it would require signs to be posted at a national park, uh, basically a small eight and a half by 11 sign to inform veterans and military service members, as well as Gold Star families that their admission is free and due for a lifetime annual pass. Ms. Luna, we appreciate your uh, attention to that amendment and to your service and looking out for our, our veterans. And I believe we have uh, agreement on both sides to, uh, to adopt your amendment. Is there any further discussion? Ms. Kamlager, do you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I support the bills in this unanimous consent package and appreciate your moving them forward. I do want to raise a procedural concern. This is now the second markup in a row where Democrats have been asked to turn a blind eye to jurisdictional violations regarding Republican UC bills. At our most recent markup, we ultimately did so in the spirit of cooperation. I trust you can understand why we were not prepared to do so again so soon today on HR 7072, sponsored by Mr. Tiffany. I do wanna thank you and your staff for agreeing to continue to work with us on the amendment we requested, which is in, within the Ag Committee's jurisdiction before taking the bill to the House floor. It is my strong hope that we will not let these irregularities become routine. I know in the past you have repeatedly called for regular order. Again, though, I urge support for these bills today and am pleased to see them advancing to the next steps. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Is there further discussion? Mr. Stauber, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank uh, Representative Hoffman and Goose for uh, sponsoring uh, my legislation, which is the Lake Winnebagosh Land Exchange of 2024. It's a good uh, bill. The Haig family on uh, Lake Winnie have been entertaining Minnesotans and people from all over the Midwest. This is a very good bill, and it's a win-win, and I appreciate the support. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Tiffany, you're recognized. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, like to, um, I'm pleased that you excused my exercise in trying to get Mr. Curtis to vote while he was not here like earlier. For me. And uh, um, <laughs> um, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the ranking member for including the Wabino Economic Development Act of 2024 in the UC package. It's simply a conveyance of 14 acres to a company that's been there for 22 years. We talk about infrastructure and the importance of infrastructure, and I think that's on both sides of the aisle. This is a critical business in rural northern Wisconsin that's really very sparsely popular populated, including for public works projects, to be able to have this business there. And um, in a few years, they're going to go out of business along with 17 people. And in a community like Wabino, 17, employing 17 people at one business is like many cities employing 500 to 1,000 people. It's a big deal. So I want to just say thank you once again for including this in the UC package. The gentleman yields back. Is there further discussion on the UC package? I recognize myself, um, and I'm pleased to advance 11 bipartisan bills today under unanimous consent. From the Federal Land Subcommittee, we have seven bills that support our veterans, improve access for individuals with disabilities, reduce the federal estate, and help small businesses. H.R. 6342, the Military and Veterans and Parks Act, is bipartisan legislation from Representative Kiggins that would increase access to national parks and public lands for veterans, our military, Gold Star families, and wounded warriors. H.R. 5665, offered by Representative Stansbury and Siskamani, would create an inventory of accessible recreation opportunities on federal lands to give individuals with disabilities better information about opportunities available to them on federal lands and waters. H.R. 2468, offered by Congressman Owens from Utah, would transfer approximately 200 acres of land to the Utah Department of Transportation so they can complete the Mountain Valley Corridor. This route will serve as an essential connector between Salt Lake and Utah counties, two growing areas needing better transportation options to reduce congestion. Similarly, Federal Lands Subcommittee Chairman Tiffany's bill, H.R. 7072, would convey 14 acres of land to Tony Wabano Ready Mix LLC, a small construction company in Forest County, Wisconsin. Passing this legislation will help this company continue uh, to serve the community and create good paying jobs for years to come. 
H.R. 5443, the Accelerating Appraisals and Conservation Efforts Act would codify precedent started under the first Bush administration to provide more flexibility in utilizing non-federal appraisers. This legislation led by Representative Lee of Nevada and Representative Joyce intends to address recurring issues with the federal appraisal process that hamper land management decisions. H.R. 5582, led by Representative Barr and Barra, would restore white oak trees across their range in e the eastern United States. The comprehensive bill will advance white oak restoration efforts through science, collaboration, and phil philanthropic partnerships. H.R. 1657, offered by Congressman Stauber, would authorize a land exchange to provide greater land and water access for a local lodge and its guests. <clears throat> this land exchange is a win-win. It will ensure constituents and visitors to Representative Stauber's district have permanent access to an important recreation destination and improve forest management of the surrounding forest by reducing checkerboard land holdings. I am proud to support these seven federal lands bills. Next, we have two bills from the Subcommittee on Indian and Insular Affairs, H.R. 4524, sponsored by Representative Newhouse, would authorize travel of officers employed under a 638 contract to compact to enforce federal laws without a special law enforcement commission. This bill is a big step forward in ensuring our Native communities are protected and supporting the tribal officers who watch over them. H.R. 6368, sponsored by Representative LaMalfa, would authorize the Department of the Interior to establish a permanent program to develop the capacity of Indian tribes and tribal organizations to manage buffalo and buffalo habitat through contracts, cooperative agreements, and grants to Indian tribes and tribal organizations. This bill also authorizes the Secretary of the Interior to enter into agreements with Indian tribes or tribal organizations to transfer, transfer surplus buffalo from federal lands onto Indian lands. Finally, we have two bills from the Subcommittee on Water, Wildlife, and Fisheries. Congresswoman Salazar's legislation, H.R. 4389, amends and reauthorizes the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act through fiscal year 2028. I commend Congresswoman Salazar for her leadership on this issue and for working with the committee to make necessary revisions to the legislation so it could, could be considered by unanimous consent today. H.R. 6235, Congresswoman Bonamici's legislation amends the Harmful Algal Bloom and Hypoxia Research and Control Act by extending its authorization as well as the Associated Research Plan and Action Strategy through fiscal year 2028. This act provides NOAA authority to research, detect, monitor, and forecast harmful algal blooms and hypoxia, hypoxia in our oceans, coasts, and Great Lakes. I want to thank all of the bill sponsors for their work across the aisle bringing this uh, set of 11 bipartisan bills, and I yield back. I ask unanimous consent on federal lands on, uh, that the Subcommittee on Federal Lands be discharged from further consideration of H.R. 1657, Lake Winnebagosh Land Exchange Act of 2023, H.R. 2468, Mountain View Corridor Completion Act, H.R. 5443, Accelerating Appraisals and Conservation Efforts Act, H.R. 5582, White Oak Resilience Act, H.R. 5665, Promoting Accessibility on Federal Lands Act of 2023 and H.R. 7072, the Wabino Economic Development Act of 2024. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the Subcommittee on Water, Wildlife, and Fisheries be discharged from further consideration of H.R. 4389, Migratory Birds of the America's Conservation Enhancements Act of 2023, and H.R. 6235, Harmful Algal Bloom and Hypoxia Research and Control Amendments Act of 2023. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the Subcommittee on Indian and Insular Affairs be discharged from further consideration of H.R. 4524, Parity for Tribal Law Enforcement Act, and H.R. 6368, Indian Buffalo Management Act. Without objection, so ordered. I now ask unanimous consent that the following measures be approved and favorably reported as described to the House of Representatives. H.R. 1657, Lake Winnie Bagosh Land Exchange Act of 2023 with an amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber, designated Stauber A&S. H.R. 2468, Mountain View Corridor Completion Act with an amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by me, designated Westerman O77 A&S. H.R. 
H.R. 5443, Accelerating Appraisals and Conservation Efforts Act, with an amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Nevada, Ms. Lee, designated Lee number one. H.R. 5582, White Oak Resilience Act, with an amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by me, designated Westerman A&S. H.R. 5665, Promoting Accessibility on Federal Lands Act of 2023, with an amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by the gentlewoman from New Mexico, Ms. Stansberry, designated Stansberry A&S. H.R. 6342, Military and Veterans and Parks Act, with an amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by the gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Kiggins, designated Kiggins 045 ANS, as amended by an amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Luna, designated Luna 69. H.R. 7072 will be no Economic Development Act of 2024 with an amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Tiffany, designated Tiffany A.N.S. H.R. 4389, Migratory Birds of the Americas Conservation Enhancements Act of 2023, with an amendment offered by me, designated Westerman Number 1. H.R. 6235, Harmful Algal Bloom and Hypoxia Research and Control Amendments Act of 2023, with an amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Ranking Member Grijalva, designated Grijalva 70 ANS. H.R. 4524, Parity for Tribal Law Enforcement Act, with an amendment offered by the gentleman or gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman, designated Hageman 208, and H.R. 6368, Indian Buffalo Management Act, with an amendment offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. LaMalfa, designated LaMalfa 67. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, the motion is to reconsider or laid upon the table. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the uh, record Representative Barr's statement on his White Oak Resilience Act. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that if the staff be allowed to make any technical and conforming changes to the documents the committee just adopted subject to the approval of the minority without objection, so ordered. If there's no further business, the committee stands adjourned.